Hi everybody, I'm Rick Beato. George Benson, a titan of the jazz world, is an artist whose talents defy the confines of genre. With a career spanning over five decades, Benson has enchanted audiences around the globe with his masterful guitar work, uniquely expressive voice, and his innovative blend of jazz, pop, and R&B. A 10-time Grammy Award winner, Benson's journey from the jazz clubs of Pittsburgh to international superstardom is a testament to his relentless dedication, unparalleled skill, and the universal appeal of his music. Here's my interview. George, welcome. Hey, my pleasure being here, brother. I want to ask you about your background growing up. What was going on at your house? What kind of music did your parents listen to? And how did you get into music at an early age? It is quite a story, but for years I was alone with my mother. My mother, I was born to her when she was about 15 years old. Okay. And so I almost grew up with her. She took me to all kinds of churches and movie theaters and live shows because she loved music. She had a nickname in school. When she went to school, they called her Sing because she sang all the time. Not because she had a professional career as a singer. She never did. Because her life got started early with me. She kept me thinking about music all the time. That was a big part of our lives, you know? And I began to learn all of the songs. They began to stay with me. The, the themes for these movies, you know? Out of the Blue was one of the songs I remember from way back then. Now you know that's a long time ago, brother. <laughs> <laughs> then at seven years old, a guy drove down our street in an old raggedy car. And he said, hey, little boy, I was playing on a lump of coal. The, the coal people didn't bother to put the coal in people's houses. They dumped it in the middle of the street so cars couldn't come down. So I was playing on top of it like little boys do. He said, can you tell me where Miss Irma Benson lives? I said, you mean my mother? He said, no, not your mother, Irma Benson. I said, yeah, that's my mother. And for a minute he was stunned. He said, all right, take me to her. So, uh, that person became my stepfather. Wow. Now, at that time, I, I have to preposition this. I was living in what they call the maid's quarters. It was a little old block house they built in the back of a hotel my grandfather owned what, he, what they called the Benson Hotel. Okay. My grandfather was a hustler, and his name was George Washington Benson, which is my name too. Your name. Yeah. And I got that name because when I was born, my father was in the army, he didn't even know I was born. And my mother was being a kid. Her mother said, name him after your father. And he'll have good fortune all of his life. She didn't lie. Because my life has been full of nothing but good things that have happened to me. Good fortune and, and good things. My stepfather, his name's Thomas Collier. Everybody called him Tom Collier. He was a handyman. He was a carpenter, an electrician, somewhat, you know, not expert, but he was decent at, at these things. And people called him for everything. We moved from this block house because my grandmother died. My grandfather was gone. So now his children who were living in that block house now moved into the hotel, kicked all the people out. And each one of my aunts and uncle took a floor. That house had electricity. The block house we lived in did not. So we had ice in the, in the ice box. And we had uh, coal in the, in the basement for heat. And we had those little lamps, kerosene lamps on the side. I grew up with that until I was about seven years old when she okay. met my stepfather. First thing he did when he met her was he went to the pawn shop where he had his guitar and amplifier. And he brought it to our new quarters now, which was my grandfather's hotel, right next door. And he plugged in uh, the, he had a record player. And he played all day long, he played George Shearing and uh, Charlie Christian with the Benny Goodman Quartet. But that amplifier with the wire going across the room from his guitar, every time he hit the guitar, the sound would come out over there. Oh man, was that fascinating. <laughs> so I put my, because I could feel the vibrations. So I sat in front of the speakers and let the vibration go right through my chest, my back. I'm going to the bathroom, he said. Now, while I'm gone, I don't want you to touch that guitar. 
Now that's a heck of a thing to say to a seven year old, isn't it? Right. Because you know he's going to touch the guitar. <laughs> sure enough, I couldn't wait till he left. When he left, I ran over to the guitar. Ding, ding, ding. I remember those exact notes. He came back and said, You touched that guitar, didn't you? He said, Now nah, you got to learn how to play it. So now I know it was a trick that he was using to get me interested in the guitar. <laughs> My hands were just too small. Couldn't play it. So a few days later, maybe a few weeks after that, he found the ukulele in a garbage can. Somebody had smashed it all up. He took it out and glued it back together, put some strings on it, painted it, and he brought it in the house and gave it to me. And he taught me the first two, three chords. I found out I could play a lot of the songs I was singing. So, oh man, this is nice. And by accident, I was out serenading my girlfriends on the on the footstools outside the steps. We had about seven or eight steps that went down from the doorway to the street. And I was serenading my little girlfriends out there. They're all kids. We're all kids. I looked at the clock downtown because my house was built on the side of a hill. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania is a very hilly place. Yeah. But you could see all of downtown from our house. We would be on the side of the hill. And I looked at the clock and it said, five minutes to seven. That was gonna be my first day at selling newspapers because when you turn seven, you could sell newspapers. So I didn't have enough time to take my ukulele upstairs. I ran down to the station with it uh, on the corner where the guy was passing out the papers for us to sell. I said, could you hold on to my, my ukulele until I come back? And he said, oh, yeah, yeah. He put it underneath. <laughs> I sold one paper that day, and that's all I've ever sold in my life, one newspaper. Okay. So for that, I got paid a penny. But the guy gave me a quarter. Newspaper was a nickel. So I made out of that nickel, I got my penny. But the 20-cent tip was mine. I saw, man, I got 21 cents. I went to the drugstore, which was right next door, and was looking in the candy counter. And uh, all of a sudden, somebody tapped me on the shoulder or hollered out, Hey, little boy, can you play that thing? Because now I had my ukulele in my hand. I turned around, put a dinky dinky dink, but he used to spend my money. Dinky 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 dinky. A crowd came around. They started reaching in their pockets for money, but I can't play, sing, and collect money at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> so my cousin came in, and he took off his baseball cap, and I guess he's my first manager. <laughs> and we collected money like you wouldn't believe. Fifty cents and quarters were very popular in those days. So we had a hat full of fifty cents and quarters. So I did that every weekend before my parents found out I was doing that. Now, we were a poor family. One day, my mother woke me up for school, and she said, where did you get all of this money it was under the pillow? Because I used to give it away every night. My friends said, hey, George, you give me a quarter. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All I wanted was some candy and popcorn, you know, <laughs> enough to go to the theater, and that was it. So I gave a lot of it away, and my mother found out I was doing that. She was not surprised. Then one day, a guy asked me, he said, little Georgie, where do you live? I said, I live right up the street, Bedford Avenue. And um, he said, take me and introduce me to your mother and your father. So I took him to the house, and he was begging my mother to let, let me perform in his nightclub, which was called Little Paris. Does that tell you something? Little Paris. <laughs> right. <laughs> he had a little, a little crazy going there. And she said, absolutely not. He's seven years old. He's got to go to school the next day. He said, not on Friday night. You can work Friday night. There's no school on Saturday. And if you work Saturday, there's no school on Sunday. And then he said, $40 a night. She said, $40 a night? Wow. That was all the money in the world to us. So they tried it out. Sure enough, I made the 40 a night plus people threw money on the bandstand while I was performing because I used to dance, sing, and play. I got a chance to hear a real band that opened the show for us. We didn't, didn't play with me. My stepfather played with me. I used to have to look at his hands to know what chord I was supposed to play next. He would play and I would transform it in my mind 
to know what he was playing, you know, that kind of thing. And one day the police came in, chopped the place all up because it was illegal after one o'clock in the morning. Okay. And a little boy in there, one o'clock in the morning, they said, <laughs> whose little boy is this? <laughs> my father, and he said, that's, that's my son. But the policeman who was, rest, he knew my natural father. Okay, wow. He said, no, no, that's not his dad. I know his dad. I went to school with his dad. So they held us all over and took us all to jail. Everybody, the show members, everybody went to jail. I learned a lot of crazy things when I went to the, to the uh, jail house. They kept the men on the first floor and the women were on the second floor. So the guy hollered upstairs, hey, Joe, you got any room for any more girls up there? And everybody broke out into a laugh. And I couldn't understand what they're laughing at. <laughs> and then the police snatched the clothes off of these girls, and these red balls fell out on the floor and bounced all over the, the floor of the police station. My father grabbed my eyes. Don't try to understand it, boy. That's what he, what he said to me. But that was my introduction to the entertainment world. And uh, I got a chance to play music in front of a crowd in a club. I had already won some contests outside of that. You know, I sang songs by Mario Lanza, by Nat Cole, and I won a lot of contests. As a matter of fact, the first contest I lost, Okay. I was sniffling on the way home. My mother had me by the hand. We were on our way home. And, and the reason why I lost, the guy who won was singing the song I was supposed to sing, but I got there too late. They said, no, that song is taken. Another guy is singing it. So I picked another song. Now I, I took second place. On the way home, my mother was holding my hand. We were walking towards our house, and she heard me sniffling. She said, what are you crying about? I said, I lost. She said, you didn't lose. You, you won second place. I said, I lost. <laughs> Real loud. Because you know? I never came in second at anything, you know, in those days. So I got a taste of what, it, what the world was, was going to be like. And that followed all the way through life. After that, I didn't let things tear me up anymore. You know, I, I began to figure things out. The most important thing was entertainment to me. So George, how did you learn how to play standards? How did you learn all the chord forms when you just had to listen to records and figure the things out? Tom Collier, my stepfather, he played great records. Those records by George Shearing. As long as there's music, body da do da You know, George... Sharon was in slightly off the beaten path with his harmonies. Yeah. But he da do da, dee da do da, dee dee da do da, bo dee dee do da, la dee do da, bo dee 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 da da da, bo dee da do da. It was sophisticated stuff, simple sophistication, but beautifully done. And Charlie Christian was completely different than anybody else. You know, the tone of his guitar was magnificent. And I found for years nobody had that sound until we ran into Oscar Peterson and uh, Kenny Burrell. I could tell they were uh, lovers of, of uh, Charlie Christian, and, and that happened later in life, you know. But uh, Pittsburgh was full of musicians, fantastic musicians walking the streets, and they remembered me on the street corners with my ukulele. Billy Eckstein saw me there, and Eddie Jefferson, he had just put out his first record, which I used to sing in the nightclub. And so one day he saw me on the street corners walking with my ukulele, and he and another friend. He said, little Georgie, play that song, I got the blues. I ranked it too, I got the blues, eh? I sang it faster than him. He fell out on the floor and rolled on the, on, on the concrete, laughing. And I'm still playing, wondering what the heck they're laughing at. Both of them were on the ground. Until 21 years later, I saw him in New York. He said, George, you won't remember this. He said, but when you were a little boy, when he first said it, I said, I know what he's going to say. I said, yeah, I remember that day. He said, no, you don't remember that. I said, yes, I do. I said, I'm going to tell you the name of the man who was with you. His name was Nesbitt. He said, and then he knew I knew what I was talking about. He said, how can you remember that? I said, he's the guy who taught me how to play pool and to play ping pong when I was a little boy. He was knocked out that I remembered that. But I found out that later in life, as I started traveling the road with Jack McDuff, 
a lot of the people I ran into knew me as a kid playing the ukulele. Some of them heard me play the guitar. I was just beginning to to blossom a little bit, you know, get a little more sophisticated than just straight blues playing. Jack McDuff. So you did the record with him in 1964. Yeah. Would Jack's playing, would he say, oh, over this change, you can do this kind of thing? No. Or did you just play this stuff by ear? It was all ears. At first, Jack was mesmerized by that. He liked the fact that I could hear good. But there was no sophistication because nobody ever asked me to play anything sophisticated. I couldn't play standard tunes because kids don't play standard tunes. And the people in Pittsburgh were blues lovers. So, and the jukebox. I was a master of the jukebox. Once I heard that song, I could play it, just about anything. So that's what Jack heard. But when I got on the road and he started rearranging tunes, I couldn't figure out the difference. I didn't know what he was using to, to base his harmonies on. So he fired me the same night he hired me. Okay. The very first night. <laughs> but he got me out of Pittsburgh, got me out of a lot of trouble. I was having domestic problems with my first wife. I married her when I was a kid. I was, got married when I was 18 years old with $5 in my pocket. How do you marry with $5, man? <laughs> but the world does things like that, <laughs> and I was one of them. So he got me out of a lot of trouble. And so I said, Mr. McDuff, I'm thankful for what you've done for me, man. Don't worry. He's, he said, man, I thought I heard something when I heard you play, but you're not going to have to, you're not going to stay with the band. He said, but I'll tell you what, if you stay with us until we get to New York, I know a guy who I think you would fit in his band nicely. I said, well, that sounds fine to me. You know who he was talking about, man? Who's that? He was talking about Willis Jackson. But you know who he had in his band then? He had discovered this young kid from Philadelphia. Who was that kid? Was it Pat Martino? Pat Martino. <laughs> so when I got to New York, I went to see Willis Jackson's band. And this little thin Sicilian boy with a great personality, very sophisticated in his approach to life and with a voice like you wouldn't believe. His voice was an octave below mine <laughs> and played guitar like breathing. It was just magnificent. To see him play was just, just a great thing. I said, man, if this is New York, I'm getting out of here fast. <laughs> I said, man, this the way they kids play like this in New York? I'm gone. But I had to meet them. I wanted to find out more about them. How do you learn to play? Where did you learn, you know? And we became very good friends. All of our lives, we, we remained friends. I took them around to see the fellows, I, people I had met. I introduced them to Grant Green. And here was the thing that, that happened. And Grant was on the other side of town. I took him from uh, the club in Harlem to a club on the other side of, uh, of Harlem. Caught him in between breaks. I said, Grant, let, it, let him play your guitar for a minute. So Grant handed him his guitar and Pat started that fabulous technique, that butterfly technique. And Grant grabbed the neck and stopped him. Hold it. You're going to burn all the frets off my guitar, he said. <laughs> I remember it was like it was yesterday, man. Those are the moments that stay with me the most in life, you know, from, from that period when I first got to New York and began to meet the elite people in the music world. George, you have such a sophisticated knowledge of harmony in your improvising. You're playing from 1964 on, there's all this language that you learned, sophisticated bebop language. At some point, you're sitting down and practicing this stuff, or were you just gigging? When, what did you work on, and how did you develop this sophisticated sense of improvising? Well, the world was transitioning into the guitar. The guitar became the instrument. If you didn't have a guitar in your band, you were in trouble, especially after the Beatles came out. I ran into a lot of people who were like me, youngsters coming up, trying to make a name for themselves in the world, trying to be heard. I never will forget I ran into uh, Larry Coryell. Yep. We were both the same age. I remember practicing with him. And he asked me, who was the greatest guitar player in the world? I said, Grant Green. He said, why so? He knew his playing. I said, because everybody you thinking about, and I said, and that includes Wes Montgomery, because he was the best known of the great players. He was the, the uh, 
undisputed master of the guitar. I said, yeah, and that includes Grant Green, uh, includes Wes Montgomery. I said, I saw him wipe everybody out. So he took off and went to New York. And he hung up under Grant Green and got everything he could get. And next thing I know, he was at the top of the guitar pole. I said, hmm, anything's possible. It wasn't that he wasn't good, because he was very good. He was very different. His playing was a combination of folk music and a lot of mixture things, but it worked good with the kind of jazz he was playing with the uh, Chico Hamilton Quartet, mm -hmm. I think. And a lot of other young players who have become, you know, great in the field. I ran into uh, many of them, but I also ran into the masters. Tal Farlow, the octopus. You, really, you can't All play like him because you got to grow some more hands <laughs> or oh, length. <laughs> and I ran into Hank Garland. He became my favorite because he mm -hmm. could swing. And he had a little bit of country, but not enough to rule him out as a jazz guitar player. And Barney Kessel, I went on the tour with him, the king of guitar. That title was not thrown away when they gave it to Barney Kessel because he was determined to let you know that <laughs> I am the king. <laughs> and he didn't brag about it. He did it with his guitar. I went on a tour with him and Jim Hall yeah. to Europe. And I remember one morning, me and Jim Hall decided to, we're gonna have breakfast and let's be quiet. Cause if Barney hears us, he's gonna come over and spoil it. Meaning he was gonna take it over. <laughs> so we were very quiet, we were practicing. Yeah, oh, that's nice, wow. The door, ding, 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 ding. <laughs> Jim said, yeah, who is it? Oh, it's Barney. He came in. Yeah, I heard that thing you were doing. Look, you ever think about trying it like this? <laughs> sure enough, he showed us how it's supposed to be played. So George, you jammed with other guitar players a lot. I listened. When they thought I was jamming with them, I was listening. Because you can't learn. If you already know something, then you don't need to, you don't need to express yourself. You already know it. You ain't gonna learn nothing. If you're listening to something, if, like a Wes Montgomery record, Boss Guitar, whatever, could you tell what Wes was playing, Fried Pies, the chord solos, things like that? Could you hear him and you'd be like, I know those voicings. I know what that no. is. I, I knew about maybe 10% of what he was playing. I had to find out what he was trying to get over. What, what was the main message? What, what was he trying to say to the public? You know, and could I say it differently? I found out that I could say it differently. Oh, I wonder why he never added this note to his octaves. Well, this is pretty. I wonder why Wes never thought of that. Ah, I can do something we even Wes Montgomery can't do. And Creed Taylor told me that one day when Wes passed away, I was doing records and they were what everybody was trying to say. George Benson is not, can't take over for Wes Montgomery, which I was not trying to do because I knew that was impossible. There's only one Wes Montgomery in, in one lifetime. <laughs> so I was playing Chattanooga Choo Choo. It had a very, very country vibe, you know. But I put a little R&B, a little jazz licks on top. I reharmonized the song during my solo section only. Okay. Because people can't hear that, Yeah. you know. Uh, uh, they listen for the melody. Could you still hum the melody? Yes. You could hum the melody all the way through. And when I got finished playing it, Cree Taylor came over and said, Wes Montgomery couldn't do that. That's the kind of thing you would never hear from Cree Taylor. An amazing thing happened with Wes Montgomery. He was my friend. You know, I used to try to get him to teach me. He said, no, I can't teach you. He was the only guy I met that said that. No, I can't teach you anything. I said, why not? He said, I'm too busy trying to learn to play myself. <laughs> That's what I said when he said, oh, Wes, <laughs> no, man, get out. I understand what he means now. Uh, it took me all my life to understand what he was trying to say. But he said something very important. The reason why we have this house today. One day he approached his boss, the, the owner of the record company, Herb Alpert, and he said, you ever heard of a kid named George Benson? Because I was still in my early 20s then, I guess. And Herb Alpert said, no. He said, you will. And that's all he said. When he passed away, Herb Alpert asked Creed Taylor, have you ever heard of a kid named George Benson? He said, yeah, I know him. He said, you know him? You think you could get him for my record company? He said, I'll try. 
And that's how I got with the A&M Records and bought my first house. Wow, amazing. I'll be forever grateful to Dick Hatton. Not just for that, but for so many things. He allowed me to hang with him when he wouldn't allow nobody else to hang. Because he knew I didn't have a jealous bone in my body. I didn't worship him, but I loved what he was doing. And, and I recognized his mastery. I knew pretty much who he was and why he would go down in history. Now you talked, we talked earlier about Joe Pass. You probably saw Joe play during that time as well. Yeah. And would you ever go see Joe play and hang out and jam with him? I would never jam with him. Cause anybody who's crazy enough to do that is gonna get eaten up. <laughs> he understood the guitar and all of its implications from the time, I guess he was young and heard the masters as he came up. But he had a little gypsy in him I saw. I called him the American Gypsy. He was slightly different than everybody else. In addition to all that mastery and his mastery of the finger style added a beautiful color uh, to his playing. My favorite guitar song I think in history is uh, a song called Terry that he did with the uh, the Gerald Wilson band. I remember burning the record out and I couldn't find it anymore and I ran into Pat Martino. He said, I got a copy of it. You can have my copy. I said, he's giving it away, you know, because he was also um, Pat Martino's favorite. Him and I used to haggle about which one was the greatest. Pat would talk about uh, Wes Montgomery. At first he talked about Joe Bass. And I talked about West Montgomery. Then after I heard Joe Pass play, I said, hey man, I like Joe Pass. He said, I like West Montgomery. So we had a little switch thing going there for a while. I want to play you a couple things here and get your reaction, some of your sure. records. This is off your breezing record. This is... When I play this for you, do you remember this? Does it take you back to that time period? Like it was yesterday. I can't believe all the years that have passed by since we did this. Because I put this band together out of guys I bumped into throughout my tours on the road. The kid, Ronnie Foster, he was 15 years old. He came to a rehearsal with Jimmy Smith, the great organ player. He wanted to hear him play, so he came to a, a sound check that he was having at a hotel. We were coming into that ne in that hotel, I was just leaving it, I can't remember now. And he was standing in back of Jimmy, watching his hands while he was playing the organ. And so every time Jimmy played something, he would lean over his shoulder and play the same thing. He's 15 years old. And Jimmy Smith has an amazing technique. So this kid was playing everything he, he saw. And he played like me, by ear. So I never forgot that. I took his number. And years later, I remembered him. He moved to New York. I asked him to join my band. He was an organ player. I said, I don't need an organ. The organ, I think, is, is moving on. I'm putting together a band with electric piano. Would you like to play electric piano with my band? He said, George, I'm not a piano player. I said, I play with the baddest piano players in the world. I think you play enough piano. <laughs> to, to, to make it interesting. So on his first gig, he had something he had never had in his life, a standing ovation on his first solo he ever played. To me, he was the greatest synthesizer player in the world. And he shaped the synthesizer. He stayed on um, 
Mr. Moog, who invented it, the one he played, and made him uh, the Poly Moog. He forced him to design a Poly Moog. He said, man, I can't play no chords on this name. Put, play some, make it so I can play chords. And the man got tired of hearing him, so he <laughs> made one of you play chords on it. <laughs> and I remember the kid, I'm calling him a kid, but he's actually only two years younger than myself. Harvey Mason, he had just graduated from Berkeley School of Music and he made his way out to California to work with Quincy Jones and he had all the tools. Great technique, great sound, could read anything. Timing was amazing, very creative. And so when Tommy LaPuma said, have you ever heard of Harvey Mason? I said, yep, that's the drummer. That's the one we should use. And I had just hired a youngster from uh, Brooklyn, New York, Stanley Banks, to play the bass. He was recommended to me by uh, Ronnie Foster. But now concerning that song that you just heard, that was the first thing we recorded on the album. Here's what's unique about that album. About a year earlier, I was in Boston at a place called EU Worlds. Sir. That was a music store. Oh yeah, remember that. You remember that? Yeah. 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 And uh, the man who managed the store, heard me playing and he said, man, I'm gonna introduce you to Tommy Gamina. He owns the Polytone, I, I had just played it. And I said, man, this is a beautiful amplifier. He said, I know the guy who designed him. He called him up, I talked to him. He said, when you come to LA, look me up, I'll give you an amplifier. So when I got there, I stopped by his store before I went to the record company, before I went to the record studio. He said, I'm gonna ship it right over to the studio. Now, just before that, before, before I got to L.A., a young kid came to my house in the Bronx, and he said, Mr. Benson, I heard that you, uh, you play guitar, and you might be interested in the one I have for sale. I said, well, I don't need no guitar, but I'll look at it. I said, let me see what it looks like. So he opened it up, and had a beautiful instrument in it. I said, yeah, I know the guitar very well. It was brand new. And I give this guy a lot of credit. His new girlfriend sent him to her old boyfriend's house to get the guitar she had just bought for him. <laughs> when he got to this guy's door, the guy said, not my guitar, man. He said, yep, you got to give it up. You got to get that goodbye guitar to give it up. So he took it. Now, he didn't play guitar himself. So he had to sell it. So he came to my house. I said, man, how much you look for it? He said, well, man, I don't know. Make me, a, make me an offer of any kind. I knew the guitar sold for about 850 or 1,000 bucks. So I offered him $550 for it. He said, well, that's more than they offered me down in the place where, I, where she bought it. So I bought it. I put it in the closet. And then on the way out to the door to the airplane, I remembered it. I said, you know what? I'm gonna take that guitar with me. It might be something I can play. It's a nice sounding guitar. So I took it to the studio, to LA. And so on that record, you're hearing me play two instruments I have never played before. The guitar and the amplifier. And what kind of guitar was that? That was a uh, Johnny Smith guitar. Gibson Johnny Smith guitar. Through a polytone amp through a polytone amplifier. The polytone... What was the early polytones? It was the yeah, they had, a twin, they had a twin speakers in it. Yeah. Just, it was built more like the, the Fender Twin. I have one of those, actually. I have a polytone like that. I have the yeah. exact, exact, that same amp with the two 12-inch speakers. Fantastic sound. Fantastic sound. So when he came to the studio, he came just in time to hear the first playback, what you played for me just now. Yeah. He said, man, who in here plays guitar like that? I said, with an insulting look in my face, I said, yeah, that's, my, that's me. He said, you play guitar like that? I said, well, at least I'm impressing somebody here. <laughs> and right after that, probably the same day, Bobby Womack comes to the studio. He brings his guitar, because Tommy LaPuma, I asked him, I said, man, if we're gonna do Breezing, which I didn't like the song at first. For years, people tried to get me to play, and I said, nah, for two reasons. First of all, I liked uh, Good Boys Abel's version. Mm -hmm. And the second one was that this, the melody was so simple, it's like, do re mi fa so la ti do, da, 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 except for one note. <laughs> so I refused to play it. 
I said, I'll tell you what, if you get Bobby Womack to come to the studio, maybe he can come up with something different, something fresh to put in the song. And he did. He said, there was something I always wanted to put in this song and I never got a chance to do it. I said, what was that? He said, do, 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 do. I said, what? That's the way we did it. I think one or two takes. That most of these recordings on, on um, the, the album Reason were one or two takes. Did you know that this record was going to be this massive number one record? No one had any idea how far this record would go. Probably the one guy who believed in us more than anything was Tommy LaPuma. He convinced me to do this masquerade. And then he didn't want it in the album because the instrumentals were going so good. He said, I don't think we should spoil this album by putting a, a vocal in here. I said, man, you got me to learn this tune, man. I went through all that trouble to learn this tune. Because I was the one who said, I don't want to sing this, that song. It didn't particularly knock me out, you know. And so he made me learn it. And now the album was finished. I said, oh man, let's, let's, let's just do this one time anyway. So they put a raggedy microphone up there, just something, just f so he could get me to stop talking about it. He said, all right, we'll do a take. And they went and got this 555 uh, electro voice. That's a talking microphone that right. they used, you know, uh, yeah, on yeah. Johnny Carson show or something. <laughs> and they put that up there. When we got finished, I said to uh, Al Schmidt, the great engineer. Mm -hmm. I said, you know something? I said, something in my voice I never liked, man. He said, and what's that? I said, too much low end. It makes everything sound muddy. He said, click. He rolled off some of the low end. I said, that's better. I said, do that again. He clicked it one more time. Click. I said, oh, that's even better. Try one more. He said, no, if I check it more, you'll sound like Mickey Mouse. <laughs> <laughs> I said, man, I'm happy. If you can just give me that, I'd be happy. One take. We did it. And when he went back to the record company and broke up there, they were having a financial meeting of some kind with all the big wigs. And he took Al Smith and he took his own. He always takes his own speakers. He don't play anything back without his speakers. Okay. So he took his speakers and his old outfit and set up in their office. They had an oval-shaped office. And all the beings were there. He said, no, 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 I'm breaking this meeting up. You got to hear this now. No, I'm breaking it up. And he played this masquerade. They said, hey, who's that? He said, that's George Benson. He said, but I thought he was a guitar player. He said, yeah, but he also sings. <laughs> and they said, they said, when are we going to get that record? He said, I'm not finished with it yet. So he did that record for about $45,000 with all the strings. Wow. The, uh, the Munich Amazing. Symphony Orchestra and the London Symphony Orchestra, and all the recording dates, four days of recording in New York. Yeah, the- the 45 Gs. The arrangements, the the sound of the record, I yeah. mean, El Schmidt, brilliant, but the Klaus Orgerman arrangements are absolutely beautiful yeah. on all those, all those songs. I wanna play a little bit more of, of Affirmation here. <laughs> Jack McDuff's stuff. This is all live playing, right? Oh, yeah. My favorite cat, Philip Church. Philip Church. This is fascinating because. You played with Phil so much. Why have a, another guitarist? Believe it or not, I, I became thrilled by a record made. It was the biggest record of its time. What's the kid's name? The blonde-haired kid that made the record. He used to talk with the talking microphone. Peter Frampton. Peter Frampton. Okay. He wrote an article one time. At the time, he was the top rock guitar player in the world. The whole world. And his picture was appearing on all kind of magazines. I said, who's this kid? So I listened to one of his records, and I said, ooh, yeah, this guy's got the right idea, man. He knows how to make people happy. I listened to his instrumentation, I said, 
I'm going to try that on my next record. That record came out, and it was somewhat of a hit. It sold twice as many records as the record before, more than that. So I used it again. Only this time I had, well, this is the second time I used Phil Upchurch. I like Phil because he thinks like a guitar player. You know, he doesn't think gimmicks. He's a guitar player he, from his heart. He taught himself how to play how to read music, first of all. Mm -hmm. Something I have a hard time with even today. When Breezy became very big, I came to him with that guitar that I told you that I got from the kid who came to my home, and I gave it to him. And he was gentleman enough to say, George, you can't give this guitar away, man. He said, this guitar is gonna be worth a fortune one day. So he wouldn't let me give it to him. Then I ran to, into Tim May. You remember mm -hmm. this kid who yeah. was the, the baddest guy in L.A. now? They, the first guy they called for record dates and movies. Yeah. He was 15 years old when I met him in Cleveland, Ohio. And he called me up one day and said, Mr. Benson, I sent one of your solos to Downbeat. Do you mind? I said, uh, no, I don't mind. I said, why did he do that? And then I saw on the cover of Downbeat magazine, free George Benson solo inside. He wrote the whole solo to uh, So What that I did. Yeah. And I remember Freddie Hubbard coming to me and saying, John, man, I tried to play that solo. Even the great Freddie Hubbard talking about himself, couldn't play it. <laughs> you know, I said, yeah, well, I don't know. I'll just be playing what I feel, brother. That's all. So I was in the studio and we were doing The Greatest Love of All. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever heard it before. He never heard it. Just reading it off the sheet. They were counting off the tempo. And he's still talking to me. Yeah, George, I got this guitar over at such and such, and they got the one, two, three, and you know, and he oh, <laughs> jumped right on it, reading music for the first time. Straight down. I said, man, nobody reads that good, man. He said, well, he said, that's one thing I can do. I read music. I said, what kind of guitar is that? This is a Ramirez. So years later, when, when Phil Upchurch came to my house in, in uh, New Jersey, I took him downstairs to my guitar room. And he saw that guitar, he said, George, do you know what this is, man? I said, I bought it. You know I know what it is, I bought it. He said, man, this is a Ramirez, man. I said, well, whatever it is, I can't play it. The neck is too big for me, I can't, I'm struggling with it. I said, he said, but you don't know what this is. I said, I know what it is now, it's your guitar. He cried. I said, Phil, man, cried over that? I said, you're my friend, man. I said, I don't know one other guitar player who taught himself to read at 45 years old and who taught himself how to play classical guitar. Nobody taught him. He taught himself. That's you. That's your guitar, man. So I got a chance to give back what he gave to me, man. He, he's a man of integrity. That's another reason why I like him. But as a guitar player... He's magnificent, always well, has been one of you, my favorites. You guys all played so well together. I guess he would fill when you were singing and he would yeah. play the background things, but when you were soloing, he would also play behind you and he yeah. would play probably stuff that you really liked, right? That's Great ears, he's got great ears. That's another one why I love him so much. And he knows how to stay out of the way. This is what Jack McDuff taught me. Comping, the word comp means compliment, Jack says. I said, you know, I never thought about that. I thought the company just kept hacking on the guitar. You know, <laughs> the gonk, gonk, the gonk, 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 gonk. <laughs> he said, no, man, comp, are you complimenting? He said, yeah, he played this, you play that, make him sound better. Years later, that proved to be gigantic for me. Because records for the radio were three-minute songs yeah. or less. You go over three minutes, everybody's mad at you if you're making, if you're making a single. So when I got to New York, because Jack McDuff would cuss you out, if you wasn't playing nothing in your solo, he'd cut you off. <laughs> you know, we'd be playing a song, if you play a good first eight bars or 12 bar blues, yeah. he let you play another one. Okay. And when it stopped being interesting, he <laughs> cut you off. <laughs> so it taught me how to heat up a song fast. I didn't build no song, wow. I heated it up instantly. Jump right on it. That's what Jack McDuff gave me. And he taught me some other things. He said, George, he says, man, blues. I said, man, I'm tired of playing blues. 
Everything got to be blues. Is everything. He said, Oscar Peterson plays blues. I said, well, I never thought about it. Yeah, he's a great player now. And he said, man, when you play, you show some technique, show some class, play some pretty chords, some funky chords. Be sure and play some blues licks. He said, that's down, that's earth. You hitting from very hard where they all live. Everybody comes out of the streets. So you hit bass when you hit the blues. Now, then they begin to understand you. So he said, put some blues in your music. I don't care what you play. So know what I, what I play. Even in that song, I just heard me play. That kind of thing, you know. But Jack put that in my mind. He was the guy who did that. I used to be mad at him, you know, because I thought he was crazy, you know. Jack, man, no, man. Every song can't be that. He said, well, that's what the world is, man. There's a uh, version of On Broadway that, that's, uh, that I love playing for people. When I tell people about this is how you play with feel. Because to me, your feel on this, this is you live. <laughs> from 1978. <laughs> Your time feel is so good. The pocket is so good. Well, I have an advantage that for years I played with singing groups. Mm -hmm. I know this song backwards, the, the basic song. And we had a big problem when I got ready to record this because my bass player, who's a simple fellow, you know, he plays very basic stuff. And he's got a great feel when he, when he plays. He said to me one day, he said, George, that won't work, man, when we were rehearsing this. I said, what do you mean, man? It won't work. The song don't go like that. And I said, man, you know, I know how the song, Stanley, you weren't even born yet. I said to him, but actually he was. <laughs> but I remember the group. What I didn't remember was that the lead singer was not Benny King. I thought it was Benny King at first, but it wasn't. It was a cat named Rudy, one of my favorite singers. I'm glad I didn't remember that because I would not have recorded the song had I remembered it. Wow. That he was the lead singer. He sang, up on the roof. He had such a great baritone voice, you know, and resonance in his, in his singing. And I heard something from the great Quincy Jones. I started an association with him because this was before we worked together, you know, on the project. He said, you know, George, years ago everything used to be a one bar phrase. Now everything is a two bar phrase. Hmm. I didn't want to appear ignorant, so I didn't say anything. Till I got home, I said, what the heck is a two bar phrase? And then I was listening to a record by Rod Temperton. Bom, ba dum, bum, bee, be dum. Ba, ba, da, two bars. Boom, ba, da, do, bee, be da, one bar. Bee, be da, second bar. I said, oh. So on Broadway was a one bar phrase because it went boom, boom. One, the next bar went boom, boom. Boom, boom. Boom, they say the neon light. Boom, boom. On. That's boring to me. So I change it to bum, 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 two bars, bum, bum, snap, bum, 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 and then I put staccato, bum, 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 I said, oh yeah, okay, there we go. <laughs> but that's how simple we put songs together. And that's when I got all of the, uh, 
uh, the flack from the band. Oh, no, that won't work. I said, there's a reason why I'm standing up here in this band leader's seat right here. I got to keep us working, and this is how I do it, doing something different. The record came out and said, boom, straight to the top of the chart. A lot of our records did because we dared to do something slightly different. And it don't have to be magnificently different or, or, or go into con, you know, contest with West Montgomery or, or Barney Kessel or Grant Green. It doesn't have to be. Because first of all, you can't contest those guys. Their careers are as solid as gold. I leave their stuff alone, man. I, I afford their stuff like the plague, <laughs> you know, because I enjoy them so much and like they are. I, I, to me, that would be uh, distorting their contribution, you know, or diluting it, except for things like vibrato, mm -hmm. which I learned from uh, other players, certain phrasings that they do. But to copy lick for lick, no. To me, that's a, that's an easy escape route. You can get that anywhere. You did the record Other Side of Abbey Road back in the, really right after the Beatles came out with their record. Yeah. This is um, Golden Slumbers and You Never Give Me Money. Once there was a way to get back home world. I haven't, hadn't sang in years. Once there was a way to get back home, sleep, little darling, do not cry. Are you playing with, are you singing with a group here, with the strings? Yeah, that, that's a, a, uh, a chamber orchestra. Okay, so you're, mm -hmm. so you're doing, doing this that, live. You're doing that live, right? New York Symphony Orchestra players. Mm -hmm. That is amazing. Yeah. How many times would you, would you just rehearse it a couple times and then just do it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That, that is, was, uh, what's his name? He just died, the great arranger. Was it uh, not Don Sebesky? Um, That's him. Don, Don Sebesky. Don Sebesky. Yes. Master. Yeah. Master musician. I've done some really wonderful things, but he, like Ron Carter, they used to put suits, I call it. They used to dress my records up when, when they were doing sweetening. But in this case, we got a chance to do this stuff live. I remember when we finished this, guys from the orchestra came over and gave me cards. They said, George, I knew you was a singer. Hey, man, you got to give me a call. I got some commercials. And I, I did. I did some commercials with these guys, you know. But that was one of the few songs I got a chance to record vocally because I hadn't sang in a long time. So you can see my voice was not quite there yet. But I... I George, your voice is amazing there. Thank you for saying that. But seeing how that got on the road, on, on the, off the ground, Creed Taylor called me into his office, and he said, uh, George, I want you to listen to something. So he played the record for me. He said, I want you to pick something from here, man, something we can record. So he take it home and listen to it. So I took it home and listened to it, and I came back the next day. I said, man, everything on here is a monster. He said, good, we'll do the whole album. I said, wait, wait a minute now. Oh, you know what that'll do to me? People are already complaining about me being too commercial. But we did it anyway. And the disc jockeys cried blue murder. They wouldn't play the record and so forth and so on. But it saved my life. Because when Reason came out, they said, how come we don't know George Benson? That side of George Benson, he's never done anything. Yes, he did. Then they went back and heard the other side of Abbey Road. They said, yeah, he did do some stuff. He was trying right. to tell us something then. Y'all wouldn't let him say it. <laughs> you know, that guy. But that's how I got off the ground. Creed Taylor is the one who, who introduced me to that record. And then I got comments from the, Paul McCartney and, and the guys in the band sent me a message. They said, man, we love what you did with our music. So that was more than anything that, that could be said about uh, my performance. You have this massive hit with the Breezen album. Grammys, number one in multiple categories. And then your career gets even bigger. Did you start thinking of yourself more as a singer or did you always think of yourself as a guitarist and a singer? We are who we are. And I've been playing guitar. I've devoted a great deal of my life trying to learn this instrument, which I still do. And I've been singing since I was born. You know, since a little boy. 
So one day my manager said, well, George, you don't need to play guitar no more. Why don't you just put the guitar down and sing? I said, man, you, you have to be kidding me, man. I said, I couldn't do that if I wanted to. I said, no, I've devoted, I love the instrument. Yeah, I like being in front up on, on the bandstand, but I'll figure it out. I'll find a way to make it work. And after a while, it became a controversy because the guitar lovers went that way, and then the people who liked the vocals didn't care nothing about the guitar. So. But I found records that allowed me to do tidbits. You didn't have to prove anything. You just find a good song and then let it be what it's going to be. If the guitar is sticking on doing its thing, we go that route. If somebody else is doing something else here, the vocal's sticking out, let's lean in that direction. So I had two careers that I had not counted on. Well, it's interesting because scatting along with your playing, where you're actually singing and playing together, yeah. is another signature of your style. Yeah. How could you sing these incredibly sophisticated lines that you played? You did it all the time. I mean, but how did you get so good at doing that? Did you just Best hear it question. in your head? That's the best question. When I was a little boy, working in clubs around Pittsburgh, nightclubs, I was copying the jukebox. Everything on the jukebox, just about anything that was a hit, we knew it, we could play it. But my father didn't like my play. I'm talking about my natural father. Mm -hmm. After he came from the army, I was four years old by the time he came back from, from uh, World War II. But as I grew up, uh, I drew closer to him and um, he was a musician too. He played piano, drums, and trombone. I had a discussion with my father, he did one. He asked me, why you keep playing that corny music? I was playing the jukebox, you know, trying to stay alive. You know, I worked every weekend. I didn't make much money, but I worked every weekend. Why do you keep playing that corny music? I said, man, the people don't think it's corny. The people like it? He said, what do they know? They don't know nothing about no music. I said, what should I be playing? He said, why don't you play like Charlie Parker? I said, Charlie who? He said, now I know why you can't play nothing. You never heard of Charlie Parker. I had heard the name, but it never meant anything to me until then. And then one of the guys in my band, my saxophone player, I took him home late at night one time. He had, I had to drive him home from the club and he said, man, you better drink a cup of coffee. Don't, don't make that trip back without drinking some coffee so you can stay awake. And then you put on Just Friends. I said, man, who in the world is that? He said, that's Bird, man. Charlie Yard Bird Parker. I said, man, play that again. He played it again and again. And every time after that, every time I got five cent or 10 cent I put, or a quarter, I put it in the jukebox and play. Just friends. I learned that solo. I couldn't play it, but I could hum every note. I knew every note in that record, like 95 to 99 percent of all the notes. I could hum along with the record. After that, everything was easy to me. The stuff I was playing was simple compared to that. So when I thought of something in my head, I could sing it or play it. My playing was never sophisticated like Charlie Parker's. <laughs> Starting to get there, but not quite. <laughs> And uh, I started doing that on record with this masquerade, you know, and realized how popular it became so fast. Because people, I said, I thought everybody did this because you could hear guys humming in the background. Yeah, lightly they, in the background. Yeah. But you were actually singing into the mic. You know, I asked for the microphone and Creed Taylor thought I was crazy. We did a version of Moody's Mood for Love many years ago in Rudy Van Gelder's studio under Creed Taylor's tutelage. They stopped me in the middle of the record. Nah, that boo, the band booed, and Creed Taylor, nah, that won't work, that doesn't work. Let's do something else. When Quincy Jones asked me if I knew it, I said, yeah, I know it. put a microphone right here, man, and let's do that. And then Creed Taylor went all the way back and found that recording half done. I don't know how he finished it. But he finished, he did a finished version of something we only did half of. I said, boy, this recording business is getting kind of interesting here. <laughs> but yeah, man, I had to climb a mountain to get to where we are. They didn't give it to us. We, we fought our way 
to where we are today. And I'm not bragging about it because, you know, uh, like anything else, music has its good and bad points and hard points. You got to accept it all. You know, the harsh criticism I got from people, uh, radio stations, who I heard them tear my record up on the radio and stamp it into the floor on the radio. The guy cracked it up and he explained what he was doing. Yeah, throw this on my jukebox and crash it in the floor. He did that in Chicago. <laughs> I said, wow, this guy really doesn't like me. But that didn't had no effect on my playing because I kept going straight ahead. I knew that one day everything I was doing was going to come to fruition. It was going to mean something. I didn't know what it was going to mean, but it was going to mean something. Is there someone that you never played with that you said, oh, I wish I could have played with them? I wish I was up to that level to play with John Coltrane. Did you ever see Coltrane play live? Yeah. Some what of was the that greatest like? experiences of my life was hearing him play in Detroit at, at uh, one of those Elks clubs or Masonic temples on the second floor of is a ballroom, and they had the line around the corner trying to get up there, and you could hear them from going up the steps to buy your ticket. You could feel the band. I, was, I never experienced anything like that. When I got into that room, it was like going to heaven. You could barely hear, and this guy was one of my father's best friends, uh, the, the bass player that played with him. Was it uh, Jimmy Garrison? No. Jimmy Garrison. Jimmy Garrison, yeah. Yeah, him and my father were together all the time. Okay. Jimmy Garrison, and uh, and he introduced me to train the next day. So would this have been with McCoy and Elvin? McCoy and, and Elvin. Oh, so that, look at that man, quartet. Man, that, that, that feeling. How heavy was that? <laughs> oh, man. I see, and I think that's where uh, hard rock came. What they call it rock now? Acid rock? I think that's where it came from. They were trying to emulate that from a rock point of view. Yes. But never heard anything or felt anything like that in my life, man. So I became a gigantic fan of John Coltrane and all the guys in the band. As a matter of fact, when I got a chance to work with McCoy Tyner later, mm -hmm. I realized not only was he a great player, but he was versatile. Yes. He, more versatile than he knew he was. I could hear him doing things he wouldn't even imagine doing. He said, you want me to play that? Okay, man. And he'd tear it up, add some classical licks here and there, you know, classical attitudes. And I got a chance to do something I had always wanted to do, uh, a ballad with him. So we did, uh, um, sometimes I wonder why I been the lonely stardust. Mm -hmm. And, uh, couple of other standards. But that's one of my favorite albums, the one I did with him and Ron Carter. Mm -hmm. So my life has taken me to some incredible places, man, and uh, each one of them has its own life to it. Without trying to prove anything, I love that instrument. This The guitar has always been a great challenge to me. I don't think we'll ever get everything it has, the, the potential that it has in no one lifetime. I've heard Django Reinhardt, I didn't think anybody would ever come close to Django Reinhardt. I heard Charlie Christian. I heard the stories. John Hammond became one of my best friends. He gave me a great kickoff when I worked with him. He told me something uh, in the beginning. He said, you know, I can see Mr. Benson. Oh, George, he called me. You do a lot of things and you do them all well. He said, but if you become known as a jazz guitar player or a jazz man first, you see, you'll, you'll have longevity. Your career will live a long time. He wasn't lying. I want to ask you about this guitar, the Ibanez, your signature guitar. This is really a unique instrument, and it was one of the first signature guitars that anyone really did. How did this come about? Did Ibanez approach you? Phil Upchurch came to me one day and said, George, have you seen these new guitars, man, called Ibanez or Ibanez? I forget what he called them. I said, no. He said, check them out, man. So I went to a music store in Seattle, Washington somewhere, and I picked up one and I played it. I said, man, this is a great instrument, man. I said, uh, wow, man, yeah, Phil, I, I finally got a chance to see that guitar. So when we did the album Weekend in L.A., mm -hmm. they sent some representatives up to my dressing room. 
They said, yeah, we're from Ibanez Guitar. I said, man, you know, you make a great guitar. He said, the problem is you don't have any your own designs. That's all you need. He said, they said, you have any ideas? I said, yeah. <laughs> That's how we got started. Just that fast, that quick. And did you want to have a guitar that was smaller, that wouldn't feed back? What was your idea of, of this design here? Years ago, I saw a guitar in a, in a window, but it was a solid body guitar. It looked hollow, but it wasn't. I said, man, that would make a nice idea, design for a guitar to make it smaller. We don't need all that big box anymore. So when they asked me to design, I said, I got two designs. I drew them on paper first. One guy tried to sue me and say I stole his design. I said, I got the original paper that I drew this guitar on. I said, you want to waste some money? Sue me. <laughs> <laughs> so I drew it on paper. They took it. The thing that they designed was this nice tailpiece mm -hmm. because it has it goes up and down. And you can adjust your tension on the strings by using that tailpiece. And uh, they took it for a year. And uh, when I went to Japan, they took me to a building. Yeah, everybody was there. The Sony brothers, two of the Sony brothers were there. And remember Nakamichi tape oh, yeah. recorders? Yeah. Mr. Nakamichi was there. Okay. Wow, I was knocked out, man. <laughs> and they took pictures of me with my, my own brand guitar, which was unreal. It took me another year to realize what they were saying here. I thought it was just some initials. You know, just an indication of who it was. But I noticed the, the cow in the background. That's a prince's cow. They were saying something with that. And I said, man, that's how much they, they think of us, man. I said, I'm making some headway over there in this country, in Japan. And they thing took off. It's been in production since probably, what, 78 or so? Yes. Yeah, I, I designed it in 77 uh, when we did the album um, Weekend in L.A. You're holding it on the cover, right? I, I believe, aren't you? Uh, I think, yeah, they took it because the album came out a little bit later. The red one is my latest version of it. It is called the Super 10, the GB Super 10 guitar. And it speaks well. It's got a nice sound, looks great. So people are... Racking up on this guitar. George, I, I want to ask you this because you're one of the few people that can answer this. Back in the 60s, what kind of guitar strings? Now, you've used flat wounds. Were all guitar strings flat wounds back then? Did they even have no. round wound guitar strings? No, that be that was something that came along later. Okay. In my day, when I was coming up, everybody used, there was only one string, the black diamond. Black diamond. That's all they had. <laughs> that is crazy. With all the different things they have out now, I mean, it was very limited what kind of strings you could use. That's right, man. We only had that uh, black diamond. And the drag with the black diamond was if you kept them on too long, they, they would develop spurs on them. Yeah. So I began to stick my finger. Yeah. So it had an effect on my playing. I was always afraid I was going to run into one of them spurs, so I learned how to hit the fingers, the strings softer. That's why my sound became different, because I wouldn't grab the string and hit it for a nice solid sound like a lot of guitar players do, and they get more resonance by doing that. I was afraid I was going to catch a spur, so I learned how to skip lightly, the light fandango. <laughs> you know? When I arrived, George, I showed you that I have one video It's on my phone of you playing. It's from an instructional thing that you did years ago. And I always go back to it because I keep it on my phone to remind me of how good someone can get on the guitar. And I just love how you play this chord solo. You're just improvising over a blues, but it's, it's amazing to me.
If you wrote that out for a sex section, that would be a perfect sex solely for a big band. I mean, it's really amazing. And you're just improvising that. Yeah, true. All the reharmonizations, all the substitute chord changes, everything. Yeah. George, do you even have to think or is just just you just hear that? Well, my mind is always on what has transpired in my life. And I've heard a lot of great, great people from all walks of life and all kinds of music. So they all of them, they're all there. Recalling it is the hard part. Executing it has become a, little, a lot easier, but uh, you have to think of it first and then figure out how you're gonna approach it. And, and to me, it has to swing. It's still, it's not just notes. You know, that kind of thing. Like, like I would sing it. You got to make the guitar sing. That's hard to make these six strings do what that one voice can do. <laughs> but you're singing all the, all the, the lead line that you're hearing in your head, and yeah. then you're putting all the harmony under it. That's true. But uh, to me, I always condense things down to its... Smallest point. My few students I've ever had asked me how to improvise. I said, well, man, first you have to learn the harmonies, what's, what's possible. But I condense things down. See, they teach in school. I heard they teach in school. I don't know because I never went to a music <laughs> school. That the world is made out of uh, four chords, major, minors, augmented, and, and diminished chords. I condense those down to two. So I don't, while they have to worry about four, I only worry about two. <laughs> so that gives me an advantage. I can move faster and I know that I ain't got to search for nothing. No, which, where's the fourth now? Uh, you know, where's the raise five? Where's, I don't have to think about that. It's either major or minor, depending on where you're putting it and where the melody note is. Uh, the melody to me is the most important part. On all of Charlie Parker's songs, you could always hum the melody. All of them. And that's what made it to me so outstanding. But what's going on between that, setting it up, those substitute changes, that's the word I was looking for earlier, the substitute changes give it a color that people have not experienced, except in your instance, when they hear you play it, they hear your substitutions, and that makes it personal. So uh, that's the thing that Bird did so beautifully. His transition from one thing to another, one harmony to the other, simply done, but beautifully done. Mostly phrasing. The phrasing was so magnificent, you couldn't forget it. You were mentioning me playing a big band when I play with a big band, they're playing all these chords up underneath me. I'm trying to figure out what can I play that won't hurt what they're playing, <laughs> you know. I did an album with the Count Basie Orchestra, and they're so magnificent because the, um, uh, the arranger, Frank Foster was his name. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. His arrangements were so incredible, I knew better than to try to, to uh, equal that. I had to go in harmony with it so that the song would stick out because he had already thought it out harmonically. He's won two Grammys in his life and both of them were on my records. One of them was a song I wrote for Basie 
it came to my head one day, and I worked it out, you know. That was to me that was real bassy, you know. I said it needs a little highlight. And Frank Foster said, okay, let's try that. And it went on a Grammy right fast. So I've had some great experiences. I took it to Basie and played it for him one day after he played at a place near, near my house. And I went backstage to visit him, and I said, Mr. Basie, I wrote a song for you. I think you should at least hear it. Maybe maybe you might like it. Play it. So I played it, and he said, oh, we're going to go in the studio and record that right away. And then he passed away before mm -hmm. we recorded. The band was breaking up. I said, no. Man, let's put this record down. And the money they made from the record allowed the band to stay together. So the Basie Orchestra continued because Fantastic. of that record, and which makes me happy and very proud that I was played a part in keeping the band together. Well, George, I am so honored to have a chance to talk to you today and to meet you in person. Thank you so much for doing this. Hey, the pleasure is mine. Thank you for coming to my house, man, and brightening up my day, brother. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. <laughs> I'd like to once again thank George for being my guest today. Leave a comment, hit the subscribe button, and thanks so much for watching.